Hi, everybody. My name is Lori Mishley, and I'm here to talk to you about a study we did today looking at the use of nutraceuticals and over-the-counter supplements in people with Parkinson's disease. As you all know, many of our patients are using supplements. We get asked about them a lot in clinic. The, the value of this industry is growing astronomically. And um, in spite of some biologically plausible rationale for use, most of these uh, supplements have not been adequately studied in formal clinical trials. Uh, observational studies may fulfill an unmet need in Parkinson's disease research. Randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials take a long time and are ridiculously expensive. Observational studies are faster, less expensive, and tell us not about success in a controlled environment, but effectiveness as is seen in a real-world setting. What we did is we used a sample data set from the MVP study. This is an ongoing prospective observational study. What we did is we looked at people who responded to the survey in 2021. And our goal today is to report to you on the supplements that are being used most commonly and whether or not any of those supplements are associated with improved outcomes over time. What we did is we asked individuals to check the box for any supplement for which they had consistently taken over the six months prior. This was a cross-sectional analysis. Everybody in the cohort had a self-reported diagnosis of idiopathic Parkinson's disease, and all of our regression analyses adjusted for age, gender, income, and years since diagnosis. Our primary outcome measure was the PROPD. You can see uh, what that outcome measure is all about if you go to propd.org. Um, 1,089 people responded to the 2021 survey. Uh, they were There was a nice spread um, across income. Uh, this was a little bit skewed towards higher education, approximately uh, more women than men answering, responding to the survey. Um, so what we saw is that uh, the these are the 10 supplements most commonly used in Parkinson's disease, vitamin D, B12, vitamin C, fish oil, CoQ10, curcumin, melatonin, calcium, multivitamins, and probiotics, topping the list. In terms of supplements associated with better outcomes over time, there were 13 that reached statistical significance. Many of them are ones that have been studied before, coenzyme Q10, uh, vitamin C, fish oil, uh, homocysteine, lowering B vi vitamins, but there were some surprises. Topping the list were ginkgo, NAD, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, oral glutathione, macuna. Um, you, I want to point out that there were only a handful of people, of the 1,089 people in the study, only a handful were using some of the top supplements. So I want to caution people in over-interpreting these data. I will point out that there were a lot of supplements that we asked about that were not associated with benefit. None of the studies, none of the supplements we asked about were associated with any harm. Um, it may be that these supplements don't work. It may be that this analysis was underpowered. It may be that the supplements are helping individual symptoms and not overall progression. So in conclusion, in this real world natural history study, there were 13 supplements statistically significantly associated with better outcomes over time. All 13 of them have some degree of biological plausibility and preclinical data. Um, Obviously, this is an observational study. These data do not allow us to make any causal inferences. And I want to warn you that this is a self-selected cohort. Uh, a lot of people interested in complementary and alternative medicine, they may be taking more supplements than average, and therefore these data may not be generalizable. I want to warn patients that just because it's on this list, you should not necessarily start supplementing and um, that Parkinson's disease providers are encouraged to familiarize themselves with the supplements on these lists as patients are likely to be seeking advice. Um, in a real world setting, these 13 supplements are associated with better outcomes over time. They all have some good rationale for use and all 13 of them, I think, were, are, warrant additional investigation in future prospective clinical trials, ideally randomized controlled clinical trials. Thank you to the patients who have participated in the study to make it possible. The NIH for launching this study as part of a KO1 and Bastyr University for hosting the REDCap database and the community members whose donations made this possible. Thank you.